Right? Okay. All right. So uh, it's good to be here. The talk is about uh, uh, non terrestrial networks, which uh, are an, an important component, or at least they're considered to be an important component for the 6G vision. Uh, so this work uh, was done in collaboration with a number of people, especially Marco Giordani, who's my colleague at the University of Padova, and uh, some of you know him, uh, as well as uh, Slim Aluini from Kaust uh, and uh, his uh, student. Okay, so I'm not gonna bother you too much uh, with uh, you know, introductory things. We all know where we're going, 5G leads to 6G and uh, hopefully this will be the next step towards uh, uh, more application, more services, more seamless digital integration with the world and, and everything that uh, comes with this uh, promise. Now 5G is here, as Stefano was uh, mentioning this morning while we were waiting for coffee that 5G is great here, a lot of uh, uh, high speed connectivity. But is it really here? Well, of course, you know, what we're seeing is uh, a small part of what is uh, 5G as, as standardized uh, by you know, the 3GPP in the different releases. And so there's a lot still to be done, but that's usual, right? We start at the beginning with a limited set of capabilities and then during the following roughly 10 years, this will evolve and then it will you know, lead to the next uh, G, uh, which comes once every 10 years, roughly. Uh, so the uh, you know, three use cases that are typical of 5G are listed here, you know, the ultra reliable low latency communication, the enhanced mobile broadband and the massive machine type communication. So this is uh, what we're gonna see. And this will evolve from you know, when the deployment first started through the following decade. And while doing that, uh, uh, we start discussing some uh, scenarios that may not have been central to 5G, but they're becoming important and they will represent you know, areas of interest. Uh, for 6G, I'm, listed, I'm listing some of them here uh, that relate to what uh, I'm gonna talk about. Uh, so rural connectivity, public safety, network resilience, automation, energy and environment. So things that uh, you know, are not uh, maybe directly related to the uh, digital experience we have as individual users, but become important in a global context where we want these systems to provide also uh, safety and uh, global connectivity to everyone. So this is you know, the usual timeline. Uh, we are at 2021 here. And so these are the different uh, releases coming up and the different standardization bodies or industry fora that uh, discuss these kind of things. Now, use cases, you know, many uh, are being discussed. Uh, one that was of special interest to us that motivated some of the work I'm gonna present is worldwide connectivity, uh, which comes from this uh, observation. So in 2018, uh, we have, you know, roughly half the global population living in urban areas, uh, but you know, two thirds are using a mobile subscription. Now things we take for granted, uh, you, uh, nobody doesn't have a phone these days, but actually 4 billion people don't in the world, okay? So they don't have uh, access to the, to the network. And so they cannot benefit from, uh, you know, the, the things that we take for granted, like access to job opportunities, education opportunities, entertainment opportunities. And this is uh, uh, at the global level, a big problem. Uh, there are at least two issues that need to be considered. Uh, well, first of all, this four, four billion people who don't have access to the network represent a huge untapped business opportunity for whoever is in the business of providing connectivity and services applications through the digital connectivity. Uh, but even more importantly, uh, this is uh, a humanitarian emergency because a lot of people don't have access to 
opportunities that we understand are critical and very important for uh, the economy, the quality of life, uh, and the opportunities to uh, get out of poverty or situations where uh, you know, quality of life is uh, not uh, desirable. So you know, there are many reasons why we may want to go for worldwide connectivity, but even in the developed countries, you know, even in, uh, uh, in the US or in Europe or other in Asia, the, uh, the way 5G provides connectivity has some uh, issues. Here I'm providing two examples. One is uh, the, uh, this chart to the left, which uh, uh, shows the connectivity outage during a hurricane in South Carolina. So you can see that even in places where the terrestrial infrastructure is uh, quite developed, uh, in the face of some special events, uh, this infrastructure can be compromised. And so uh, in situations where in fact connectivity becomes crucial for public safety or for uh, you know, rescue situations, uh, it's not there. And so this is an issue with 5G doesn't really address the resiliency of the infrastructure, essentially because it relies on a terrestrial only infrastructure, which can be compromised in, uh, uh, in the event of a natural disaster. The other example here to the right is uh, the well-known you know, hotspot type of uh, scenario where you have uh, a huge peak of traffic in a small area. And for this case as well, the current infrastructure is not well suited because uh, it uh, tightly couples the location of a access point or a base station to the immediate surroundings, especially if we think of uh, you know, 5G millimeter wave type of uh, communication, where each base station can only cover a small area. And this doesn't scale well, because uh, when there is a peak here, even if maybe in other nearby areas, the traffic is very low, this cannot be compensated. And uh, when you get the peak, your base station cannot handle it, okay? And so the coupling of the terrestrial infrastructure with the actual small footprint of the service area is a limitation of this. Uh, and again, 5G does not really address this except by providing uh, densification. And so we've done this for many years, right? To provide more capacity and better connectivity, we have densified the network installing more and more equipment, but there's only so much you can do for several reasons. Uh, also, if you densify too much, uh, then especially if we go back to our issue of worldwide connectivity in rural areas uh, or uh, uh, maybe countries where uh, we have you know, deserts or, or areas that are hard to cover, then you have, uh, besides deployment issues, then uh, you have issues to maintain the network, to repair the network if there's a fault. Uh, you have issues to power the network. So you know, the, 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 these are all issues that make it hard and sometimes economically not convenient. So there's, in some cases, there may not even be a business case for this type of infrastructure. And so this, uh, uh, you know, go against, goes against uh, the, the, this worldwide connectivity vision. And so, you know, the, this concept of internet of or for everyone uh, is of course important, but it has a number of issues. Okay. So one way to address this, uh, this is a picture I'm taking from a paper we had uh, in the Anthropoly Wireless Communication Magazine recently, talking about rural connectivity and digital divide. And this tries to summarize uh, uh, different challenges and different areas where we can work. And uh, in the area of accessibility, which is in the upper right uh, corner of the Pentagon there, uh, technologies that are being considered include NTN, non-terrestrial networks, uh, free space optics, 
and, and others. So clearly, this uh, uh, non-terrestrial deployments will play a role in this. Uh, and people are starting looking at those now, so we don't exactly know what's going to happen or how this is going to evolve. But clearly, it is an area of a great interest. So from what I've said so far, you know, 5G networks uh, uh, have limits because they have been designed essentially still as a two-dimensional infrastructure, right? I mean, you may have some places where you have high-rise buildings, uh, so you have some deployment in the vertical dimension, but by and large, this is just uh, a two-dimensional thing on the surface of the earth. And what we would like to see is uh, to exploit the Z direction, so the uh, vertical direction, by deploying a number of different objects, different nodes that uh, may provide different capabilities and they may work together. And so how to deploy this, how to manage all these objects and how to orchestrate the resources that these objects provide uh, is an important problem. And also it's a challenging problem right? because it becomes you know, an inherently multidimensional optimization, which uh, has its own uh, challenges. Now here you see, you know, a cartoon which shows, you know, all the right uh, keywords, uh, you know, rural disaster, uh, high speed, area, defense, public, safety, edge cloud, you know, all of that. Uh, so this, you know, the idea is that we'd like to be able to manage this kind of thing. And the applications are many, of course, you know, uh, Satellite broadcasting has been there forever. And so we know that very well. That's a clear application to cover a very large area for a broadcasting type of application. But clearly there are many other things you can do with this type of infrastructure. You can uh, uh, distribute content uh, uh, specifically in different areas by using directional communications. You can offload traffic. So given the coverage, of a satellite, which is quite large, you can use that coverage only in a small piece of the footprint where you may have a high traffic peak you know, at a certain time. And this can change in space without the need to change anything besides re-steering your beam. Uh, you can also mount on satellites or aerial nodes, uh, applications, uh, edge cloud services. Uh, you can do things uh, a different layers, uh, uh, also taking into account the latency that this involves, because obviously the latency for a geo satellite is much larger than for a Leo satellite, which is larger than a, for a high altitude platform, which is even larger than uh, a drone. So you can play with this also in view of the latency requirements you have in your applications. You can have multi connectivity, so you can have different uh, ways of covering. And you can select between layers according to the needs, uh, the type of uh, requirements, and uh, the instantaneous traffic that you have. Okay. Uh, you may also have inter satellite links, something we talked about last night with Tommaso and uh, Josef. So there are many ingredients uh, in, this, uh, in this picture. Now, what are the enabling technologies that make all of this uh, possible? Now, one certainly is uh, antenna technology. So I'm no antenna expert. So from my point of view, the point of view of a communication system or network designer, this is just uh, a capability of directing our beam, so our uh, signal, uh, very narrowly towards a specific target that we want to illuminate, uh, thereby gaining, of course, uh, in terms of uh, link attenuation, and so we can uh, uh, cover those large distances that are typical of these uh, areas. So the good work done by all people in electromagnetics, as well as signal processing for the uh, management and the formation of these beams, lead to a vision where we can really provide highly directional and uh, high gain communication. So this is definitely one key ingredient to enable this type of uh, vision. Now, a second enabled technology is the use of a higher frequency spectrum. Now, we've seen this uh, 
in, in 5G very clearly, you know, the, the move, even though it's not yet available commercially, but this is one of, of the centerpieces of NR, the, the standard for 5G. The use of millimeter wave, uh, the reason why we want to use, do that uh, is because at those frequencies, there are large bands available, which uh, we can use. Uh, and of course, you know, increasing the bandwidth we can use uh, is uh, a very effective way of providing high capacity communication. So that's why we want to go there. The price to pay going there is that the higher you go in frequency, the higher the attenuation is gonna be in your uh, link. But luckily, the higher you go in frequency, the smaller the wavelength will be, which allows you to pack more antenna elements into a, into a given area, which will provide the gain necessary to compensate for this, for this uh, increased attenuation. You know, so uh, simplifying things a little bit, we can recover the price in terms of additional attenuation by offsetting it with the higher gain you can obtain through a higher density antennas. Even so, you know, the, the uh, hard uh, propagation conditions at millimeter wave uh, will raise the question. If, uh, if you think of uh, satellites, I mean, be far from the earth, uh, uh, can we still close the link? Can we provide enough capacity for this to be real? Or is it this something that provides very small capacity? And so this is not uh, uh, practical. So this is the first question we asked ourselves. And to answer that, uh, we went to a 3 gtp document which specifies a channel model for this type of systems. Uh, now the channel model has four components. Uh, uh, so they're EDB, they're added together. Now, the first two we know very well. Uh, the first is the what is called here the basic path loss, which uh, accounts for the uh, signal decay as a function of distance, which is, of course, uh, expected, plus any clutter loss or shadowing you may have due to obstructions, plus, if uh, you have it, uh, uh, fading, so multi path, small scale. Fading. So all of this is what goes into the typical terrestrial channel model, you know, that people who do wireless communications are, are very used to, okay? That is there, definitely. A second component is the building entry loss. So every time you go from outside to inside, you penetrate a wall or a window, and this comes with its own attenuation. So that also has been characterized according to materials, and things like that. Now, the second half of the model is what is typical of uh, uh, non terrestrial communications or satellite communications. It's not there in terrestrial communications because, of course, the effect in theory is there, but it's negligible at the height and frequency typically used. And so those terms are essentially zero in. Uh, in traditional systems, whereas in this scenario may become uh, quite significant, uh, and so they need to be taken into account. And these are uh, scintillation and absorption due to the atmosphere. So when the signal goes through the atmosphere, there are some physics effects that uh, produce some additional attenuations on top of what we have, you know, what we expect based on traditional models. So this document specifies equation. I don't have in these slides. In some of our papers, you, you can find equations and models and parameters that specify, you know, this type of attenuation. So we can calculate this as a function of a number of parameters, like distance, frequency, and, and all that. Okay. So based on that, what we did to answer the question is to evaluate what the signal strength at the receiver, therefore the uh, signal to noise ratio and therefore the channel capacity, which is you know, one estimate of what we can achieve in, uh, in a given link for a given SNR. And so this is uh, what is shown in this plot. So the channel capacity is on the vertical axis and the plane has a frequency on one side and the antenna gain on the other side, okay? 
And basically what this graph shows is uh, how, how much capacity you can achieve at a certain frequency for a given antenna gain. And so it shows you what is achievable. Now, as you go up in frequency, we took into account the fact that at higher frequencies, we have more available bandwidth. And so as you go up in frequency, as you see from the table on top, you have a bandwidth available, which increases, right? So from uh, two and six gigahertz, where we have you know, typical uh, channel of 20 megahertz, at 28 gigahertz, we have 800 megahertz. And then we have two gigahertz and three gigahertz uh, at high, even higher frequencies. So the one benefit of going up in frequency is certainly that of having more bandwidth. The drawback, as I said earlier, is that the attenuation is, low, is higher. And so your SNR, everything else has been the same, will go down. Now, of course, these two components will play a role in the Shannon capacity formula, which is bandwidth times log of one plus SNR. So the bandwidth on top will lead to a linear increase of the capacity, whereas the SNR that degrades will lead to a log decrease, uh, uh, it's not like it's log of one plus SNR. So as the SNR goes down, then this also becomes linear. So there is a trade-off between the two things. And, and this is uh, you know, interesting to study. And you can see here, right? if, uh, if you go, let me use this pointer so that people from home can also see, uh, as you go up in frequency, this way, then uh, uh, the capacity increases because of the bandwidth increase. Uh, and then at some point it flattens off because uh, then the uh, SNR degradation kicks in, becomes significant. And so what you gain in terms of additional bandwidth, you're gonna lose in terms of signal quality. And this depends on uh, where you are on the axis of the antenna gain. Now this, these numbers are, of course, ridiculously high. You know, 200 dB of gain is a bit uh, hard, but maybe 50 or 80 are numbers that the 3GPP is considering as feasible. So if we are in this area here, you see you can still achieve a few gigabits per second of capacity, even for uh, geosatellites that's 36,000 kilometers from the Earth, which is, of course, a very large distance. Uh, and so the answer to the first question, you know, is this even feasible? Well, yes, it is feasible. Of course, you have to design carefully. You have to uh, select your parameters and provide high gain antennas, but this is not something that cannot be done, okay? Uh, and so the trade-off here, just to reiterate, uh, uh, is between going up in frequency and having a larger attenuation, but a larger bandwidth and providing the right antenna gain, which by the way, uh, becomes more and more feasible as you go up in frequency because of the wavelength going down, okay? Then of course you can uh, uh, generate a number of these results. Well, actually the, the title is simulation. This is not simulation. This is just a calculation of uh, equations and uh, the channel formula. So it's a numerical evaluation, which is very, very easy to do. And you can play with a number of uh, parameters. So here you can see we have frequency on the X axis. Each group of bars uh, has bars for different elevation angles. So 10 degrees is like very low, 50 degrees, 90 degrees is gonna be just uh, above you. The thick bars are for uh, Leo. So as a lower orbit where the channel is uh, good and the need in terms of antenna gain is lower, whereas the small, the yellow bars are for a geo, which uh, has a much larger distance where you expect to have higher gain antenna and also to have more limited uh, performance there. So you can see how, uh, as you expect, the low elevation brings uh, a lower performance for essentially two reasons. One is that uh, the line of sight probability becomes lower. So the probability that your satellite is in visibility when it goes down on the horizon becomes lower because it's more likely to have an object that obstructs your path. A second reason why that's the case is that 
if you think of the atmosphere as uh, you know, that uh, part where the signal incurs attenuation, then if you go up the atmosphere directly, then you travel through it for a certain distance, which is a few tens of kilometers, depending how you measure it. But if, you, if your elevation, elevation becomes 40 by degrees, then instead of, uh, say, 10 kilometers, it becomes 14 kilometers, right? It's this distance times square root of two. And so the amount of distance you travel through the atmosphere increases as the elevation angle decreases. And so that's what uh, produces uh, this uh, additional attenuation. As you can see, you know, how things go, you still see that the- yeah, uh, <coughs> just, 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 I just want to uh, clarify one number that you had, right? So you're saying that as you go higher up in frequency, you have four gigahertz or, or more than three gigahertz of, right. of bandwidth. Now, is this, is this number commonly accepted? Is this from some sort of measurements? Yeah, strategy? I think we took it from, from documents uh, where I see. And, and just to follow up on that, how important it is that this bandwidth is continuous and uh, how is the availability of continuous bands? I think they, those bands are available continuous at those frequencies. But if they're not continuous, you can do carrier aggregation, you can do things like that. So I don't think it's a big, I mean, you, can, you have to do something more, but it's not uh, a showstopper if you don't have a contiguous back. Now, another type of uh, uh, evaluation you can uh, do or comparison you can do to the right there is between dense urban and rural environments. Uh, as you expect, uh, you know, in rural environments, because of uh, fewer obstructions compared to a dense city environment, your capacity is going to be better, uh, but the trade-off, you know, between the uh, elevation angles is still there and also going up in frequency. You can see clearly that as you go very high in frequency, even though from 70 to 150, you go from two gigahertz to three gigahertz, so it's a 50% increase in bandwidth, your capacity actually goes down because of, you know, the effects I was mentioning earlier, okay? Uh, another comparison here, is uh, uh, for two different values of the antenna gain, so 50 dB and 80 dB. So 50 dB is the thick bars and the narrow green bars are for 80 dB. And you can see here that uh, if you go up in frequency uh, with 80 dB of gain, you keep growing. Okay, at least uh, the, uh, for the LEO, you, can, you keep increasing your capacity, whereas if you have a 50 dB antenna, as you go up in frequency, you go down. So there's a clear trade-off and non-trade-off behaviors that depend on the design of your system. And so this uh, needs to be understood to design things uh, correctly, okay? Now, one thing that I didn't mention and, and I should mention is that all of this is based on capacity evaluations for the whole footprint of the satellite. Now, obviously, different solutions here, we have different footprint size. And so potentially that capacity will have to be divided among those users that populate that footprint. So to some extent, it's not a completely fair evaluation or comparison if you just compare the absolute capacity uh, because that's not what each user potentially could see. But if you think of this as maybe a fallback solution or an offloading solution, uh, this effect is mitigated. And anyway, this is something that will have to be studied from a networking perspective. So from a multiple access perspective or multiplexing perspective, uh, and this is not included in this, uh, in this result. Now, a third enabling technology is uh, uh, architectural choices. So it's a family of technologies. Uh, now, many things have happened at the network architecture level. Uh, we've seen the deployment and even the launch uh, done or soon to be done of uh, uh, smaller satellites. Uh, so there are now companies, uh, you know, SpaceX, Facebook, who plan to launch satellites. So these CubeSats are actually quite small satellites. Uh, and so potentially there are cheap solutions that enable a new entrance and enable uh, uh, new solutions to 
to enter the market. Uh, so this is there. Uh, also, of course, all the network softwareization, virtualization, software defined networking, network function virtualization is there. And this enables uh, you know, quick and effective reconfiguration and re you know, resetting of the whole system after it's launched. So this makes for uh, you know, significant flexibility there. Uh, one thing I want to focus on here is the availability of heterogeneous satellite networks. So with satellites at different heights, and in addition, also non-satellite aerial objects like HAPs, high altitude platforms, and uh, uh, drones that may operate HAPs at, let's say, 20 kilometers or less. These are like blimps that uh, stay there at that height. Uh, and drones, of course, that we, we all know that these are much closer to the Earth. Now, we, in this paper, we uh, studied uh, the different uh, or some architectures that could be envisioned in this uh, scenario. So they're shown here. So the one to the left uh, with the red uh, square is the baseline, which is a geosatellite communicating directly to a, an Earth station. Okay, so that's the baseline. And then we investigated uh, the situations where we have some in-between nodes that uh, break the link. So we make this into a multi-hop uh, connection uh, with two hops, with a Leo or with a HAP, or a three-hop with uh, uh, both the components. I want to understand how these compare in terms of uh, traditional metrics, such as uh, uh, the effective or equivalent SNR for the overall connection or outage probability, which is essentially the same thing. Outage probability is the probability distribution of the SNR. So it gives you a similar information. Now to notice that uh, in, unlike in this baseline, here we're talking about multi-hop connections. And so the evaluation must be done end to end. So we have to be a little more sophisticated, not much, but a little more sophisticated than we did uh, earlier, where we just measured SNR and plugged it into the capacity formula. Okay. Now the different architectures have uh, <coughs> pros and cons. So some of them are quite obvious. So in the next few slides, I have tables with pros and cons. Let me not go through the details of that, but you can easily understand. You know, if you have uh, lower nodes, then the signal quality is better. Also, if you do sensing with a lower satellite, this sense is going to be more accurate than when the system is far away. But then on the other hand, the geos are stationary, so there's no mobility management involved, whether the geos fly over your head quite fast. And so there you have, you need a constellation, you know, constellation management, you may need inter-satellite links and all that, which makes the system more complicated. Haps are easier to deploy but they uh, have a smaller footprint, which may be a good thing or maybe a bad thing according to how you look at it. Uh, and so there are you know, a number of uh, issues also related to how you manage this thing, how you optimize the deployment, what is the cost of launching and all that, okay? So, and I'll, I'll leave the slides uh, with Tomas and also I believe they're recording this. So you can take a look at that uh, either here or in the paper. So the comparison was done based again on 3GPP numbers. So there's a document, uh, 3GPP, which uh, is listed here. So NR to support non-terrestrial networks. So this is, uh, has both uh, two gigahertz as frequency and uh, 20 or 30, according to which way, uplink, downlink. So there is a millimeter wave component as well as uh, two gigahertz component. And so this table gives you all the uh, numbers for the uh, transmit power, the bandwidth, uh, the uh, parameters of the receiver, antenna gain, noise temperature, and all that, based on which you can compute things. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of performance metrics, so for a single link, you just compute the signal to noise ratio, which is given there. Uh, so this is the you know, transmit power plus something that uh, takes into account the antenna gain and antenna temperature that the path lost and the, the fading 
and then you know k is the Boltzmann's constant, b is the bandwidth noise figure. Things that you know from communication theory you can just uh, evaluate there. Now that's for a single link. If you have multiple links uh, in sequence, uh, then according to how you treat the signal at the relay, then you come up with different formulas for the overall signal noise ratio. So what I'm showing here is for amplifying forward, but you can have others uh, in other cases like the call it forward. And the altus probability is uh, uh, the probability that uh, the received signal is below a predefined threshold. So effectively is the statistics of the signal to noise ratio, the overall signal to noise ratio of the receiver. So this is what we used to compare the different uh, solutions. So, so here are some uh, pictures. So the red curve is the geo baseline, okay? And as you expect, so the, the graph to the left is for two gigahertz. As you expect, you know, that's the uh, worst of the solution because the link budget is the worst, right? If you break the link in between with the Leo or with the HAP, then you do better because uh, you have stronger links combined. And so the purple curves are for the Leo solution uh, with two different altitude, altitude 600 kilometers and 1200 kilometers. Uh, the HAP is uh, much better. And the solution with Leo and HAP is essentially the same as the HAP only. Now, when we found this, why, you know, the fact that the uh, solution with the intermediate node are better than the direct link from the geo is quite obvious in a way. Why the HAP is much better uh, seemed a little strange, right? Now, there are two reasons for that, or at least that we gave two interpretations to this. So one is the following. Suppose you, know, you look at the atmosphere and the thickness of the atmosphere, let's say is uh, 50 kilometers, 40 kilometers, okay? So that's where bad things happen to your signal because once you're out of that, uh, then you free space. So it's actually a quite benign environment. So bad things happen in that band, 40 kilometers within the surface of the earth. Now, if you break your link into two links, then if you use a Leo, then the second link, the one closer to the earth, is getting all the bad things because the Leo is higher than the atmosphere. So the second link is very heavily attenuated. Whereas if you use a half at 20 kilometers, then you're actually breaking the bad part of the connection and you're assigning half of the impairments to each link. So by convexity argument, that's the best you can do, right? If you want, if you need to assign an overall impairment and you have two links, the best you can do is give half to each, right? Not all to one, because having a very, very good link followed by a very poor link is actually not good, right? Whereas having two okay links, may be significantly better. So that's an interpretation of okay, for the reason why the half solution is better than the Leo solution. The second is, um, has to do with the numbers of the TGPP. And there, we actually have to uh, get in touch with someone who is in that group uh, or who knows why some choices have been made. So from our point of view, looking at the numbers, those numbers seem to penalize the Leo significantly. So the antenna gain assigned to the Leo uh, seem to be quite limited in a way that uh, makes the Leo solution uh, non-attractive. Okay. I don't know why they chose those numbers, if there are technical reasons why you know, the antenna gain needs to be limited, but uh, this would be interesting to find out. I don't know if any of you is into, into that, uh, but uh, this would be interesting too. So that's for the two gears. Now for 20 gears, something funny happens because here you see the Leo, solution is even worse than the geo. So this probably has to do with the second thing I said, because if uh, you break your link at the Leo, and then the second link, because of the Leo parameters is very bad, then going directly from the geo to the earth is actually better, which is what this shows, okay? Interestingly, the HAP solution 
is significantly better than any other. So this seems to be you know, the, the uh, way to go using HAPS, uh, at least from the point of view of providing good capacity in this case. Now, this uh, is the outage probability, which, as I said, is the statistics of the SNR, which shows essentially the same trends as before. So you can see here that you know, the uh, geo is the worst, uh, and, and this is the Leo, which is a bit better, and then the, the half is much better. This is uh, the 20 gigahertz part. So the Leo is the worst, then geo, and then the half. This is... Uh, uh, as a function of the elevation angle. So again, the ranking between different solutions is the same as before. Uh, what is interesting here is that the HAP has this uh, uh, steep behavior. So this uh, elevation angle will uh, uh, quickly reduce the outer probability. Whereas in other cases, you may have some floor. In some cases, this floor is actually quite high so that this becomes uh, an issue. So if you compare, these different solutions, those solutions that we considered here, these are not, it's not completely general, but it's limited to what we did. Uh, and you plot each solution as a point on a two dimensional plane, where here you have uh, on the y axis, you have outage probability, and on the x axis, you have the average capacity, then you want to be as close as possible to the lower right corner, which is high capacity and lower outage. Uh, and you can see that uh, you know, the blue triangle, which is the HAP solution, is actually the best in, uh, in both cases. These, are, these two cases are for uh, uh, two different values of the elevation angle. I don't quite remember the actual values, maybe like 90 degrees and, and 30 or 40 degrees. But uh, you can see that you know, the, the, the working point uh, that you would select based on this study is that now obviously this is a specific study, but the methodology is there. So you can do it again with your own parameters or your own scenario to find uh, what, uh, what can be done. Okay, so what are some open challenges in this uh, area? Okay, so uh, so far I have addressed two basic questions. One is, uh, can this work in terms of uh, providing sufficient capacity given the distance we have and given the use of minimum capacity? And the last one was, yes, you've got to do it right, but you can. And the second question was, if we have the choice of which architecture to choose in terms of uh, different layers, how can we select those and how we manage those? And the answer was in this picture, okay? Now, open challenges, this is a relatively new area, even though, you know, satellite communication is very old. Of course, that was essentially for broadcasting or for a point to point communication from the satellite to a big earth station, which was stationary, you know, very huge antenna and all that. Now we're talking about mobile nodes, potentially to the very end user with its uh, limits in terms of power, in terms of antenna gain and all that. And so this becomes different. Okay, so channel modeling is one thing where we need more measurements and more data, uh, especially you know Doppler characterization, which is related to the movement and, and the speed, the, the mobility of the users on the Earth, as well as mobility of the aerial nodes uh, or the satellites uh, on, the, on the space part. Coexistence, because you know those frequencies we talk about uh, are already occupied in space by satellite services, uh, you know, weather related services or sensory type, which we don't want to disrupt. And so we need to make sure that we can coexist. Uh, uh, now, all the research that, that was done on cognitive radios and you know, dynamic frequency usage and all that uh, comes handy here and can be applied, but this is still something that needs to be worked out. A physical layer, there are a number of uh, issues from you know, the traditional waveform design type of issues to selecting the right numerology in the NR standard uh, to nonlinearities that come uh, with these uh, effects. Uh, also the effect of large amount of time, of course, uh, may become an issue for some applications, but also for applying uh, TDD, time division duplexing, because uh, the, the 
channel is not going to be the same necessarily uh, because of the time lag between your uplink and downlink transmission. Also, large RTTs may get into the, in the way of uh, protocols. For example, ARQ, if you have to retransmit, then of course you accumulate latency very quickly. And also, if you, you know, in ARQ, you send a packet and keep it in memory and then send the next. Once this pipe becomes very large, then your memory requirement also becomes very large, and this may create some issues there. And so uh, these are all issues that need to be addressed. Uh, synchronization. So if you have a large footprint, then the propagation time to the satellite from one user at one end of the cell and a user at the other end of the cell may actually be milliseconds of difference. So if you need a, a common time frame, especially you know, at these data rates, hundreds of megabits or gigabits per second, then mil a millisecond difference may actually make a big difference. And so this needs to be considered and compensated and all that. Uh, initial access mobility management. Uh, so this table is taken from uh, a 3 gp document uh, where they evaluate how many handoffs do you need Per second, and you know, in some cases, maybe several thousands, which poses some problems about managing all these uh, movements and, and switches from cell, one cell to the other. And this is not because the users move; this is because the satellites fly quickly over your head, and so the handoff is because of the satellite movement. Now, in terms of initial access, uh, you know, the channel dynamics uh, may be quite fast, and so channel estimation becomes challenging here. Uh, also in multi-layered architectures, you know, in traditional cellular systems, what you do is you measure a pilot signal from different base stations, you select the one which is strongest, and then you attach to that base station. So that's a traditional way of doing initial access or network association. You may be slightly smarter and you can say, well, if I have two base stations that are about you know, similar signal quality, but one is overloaded, the other is not, then I go to the second one, even though maybe the channel quality is slightly better, of course, okay? Now here, you can't really do this uh, because you have multiple layers. And so when you attach to a, a point of attachment, then you have to keep, take into account the end-to-end -end performance, not just the performance to the access point, and so this is uh, more complicated and needs uh, uh, a different optimization setting to be done. So as an example of why this multi-layer architecture will produce uh, problems that uh, uh, are not obvious or, or not uh, completely known given the current uh, technology. Now, constellation management is another thing that I already mentioned. Uh, higher layer design, so Michele will recognize this picture. This is from a paper we published uh, on uh, the performance of TCP in millimeter wave. Uh, uh, this is actually not for satellite or flying object, but it makes the point because, you know, here's the scenario. So you can see it uh, to the right, to the left. So we have base station, we have uh, buildings or obstructions, and then we have a user that moves and as the user moves, uh, then it gets shadowed by the building towards the base station. Then once the build is, is finished, then it becomes line of sight again, then it becomes again, no line of sight and so on. And from the picture here in the lower left, you can see the evolution in time of the S, uh, SINR here. And so you see that you alternate line of sight, no line of sight. There's a clear difference between the two with the, uh, uh, you know, uh, 20, 30 dB difference in signal quality. Now, this obviously will uh, reflect on the capacity available and on the data transmission performance uh, during these times. Okay, so as you expect, uh, you know your protocol, whatever that is, will work poorly when you're in online of sight, and then it will hopefully recover when you get back to line of sight conditions. Now, the picture here shows uh, a different effect. So this is the throughput in time. So the timeline is the same as in the line of sight, no line of sight, SINR evolution. And so you clearly see that uh, you see the effect. So that's the throughput for a TCP connection, okay, layer four. 
So for example, the uh, 300 megabits per second traffic, so the, the blue dotted line, uh, suffers a little bit uh, when uh, you are in online of sight, uh, and it gives you the full 300 megabits per second when we, you are in line of sight. So that's what you essentially expect, right? Now, if you try to push it, instead of 300 megabits per second, your requirement for the traffic is one gigabit per second. So the, uh, green, li the green line is uh, that, which is uh, similar, right? When you are in line of sight, you get the full gigabit per second. When you're in online site, you drop significantly to three, 200, uh, whatever that is. Uh, you recover when line of sight becomes uh, again available, even though your recovery is a little slow. You can see these lines, the green lines uh, go upwards, not vertically, but they have some slope. So it takes some time because of how TCP works, right? To recover that. Now, the bad news is that if you design your system without uh, being careful, which is the red dashed line, and this, the difference here is just the buffer size of the RLC layer, layer two, which seems like you know, a choice which has its own implications, but it's not disastrous from the point of view of TCP. Well, in fact, it is, because here you see that when uh, <clears throat> the channel becomes a, a non line of sight, uh, then you drop your performance as you expect, but then you never recover because you know, there is a mismatch between uh, what TCP does and what uh, happens at the lower layers. And so this shows that besides the bad effects which are expected of a poor channel in some time intervals, uh, uh, there may be some longer memory type of uh, consequences that may impair uh, your connection and make it essentially useless. Okay, so this is just to show that you know it's not all about the physical layer and the SINR, but you have to be careful in designing the protocol stack in a, in a way that takes into account these uh, interactions. And so, with that, let me conclude. Uh, uh, so there is a. Uh, consensus that uh, non-terrestrial networks will be an important uh, ingredient of 6G. And we have seen a number of uh, possible scenarios where this is the case. So people are starting to uh, study this type of uh, scenarios, uh, both at the physical layer and at the network layer. So what I've shown, frankly, is little more than back of the envelope calculation. And there's nothing sophisticated here. There's no, you know, NS3 simulation or, uh, uh, you know, fancy math. It's just brute force evaluation. But still, I think uh, uh, these evaluations highlight some non-trivial and non-traditional trade-offs that need to be understood and then taken into account in order to study these networks uh, properly and uh, effectively. So the contribution here was to just highlight this, maybe raise some interest in this area and show what some of the uh, new trade-offs are that are not there in traditional terrestrial networks so that we can start with the right foot to study this type of uh, networks. As I said, we have a few papers uh, uh, that are actually listed in, on the slides. So you can find them if you're interested. And of course, you know, I'm available for questions now or even later at this email. And with that, let me stop and uh, take the questions. Um, one very quick question. So you, you raised some very interesting challenges in the ground to the satellite things. How many of these, I mean, I can understand perhaps the, uh, uh, you, there was a word called turbulence, or there, was, there was a word there, or that would be from ground to air. So some of those things go away from air to air, right? Not, when I say air to air, I mean space to space, you know, horizontal air. Is that an easier problem in your point of view compared to this ground to satellite? The problem, the, you mean uh, the, the satellite satellite link? Or? Now the attenuation problem is probably not there because uh, you're in free space. So uh, it depends how these constellations move. So if the distance is fixed, then your capacity is fixed. If the 
distance between nodes may not be the same, it changes time, then you may have scheduling times to push data. Uh, yeah, pointing issues. Uh, you have an issue of uh, what technology you should use. Should you use uh, fixed phase optics? Should you use linear waiters? I mean, there are issues that uh, are still open there and may be interesting to study. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was wondering. So we you all uh, showed showcase mainly like the meter wave we saw, right? But for the meter wave and any other, you know, very high frequency uh, band, we need like a lot of directionality too, right? So are these these like informing your directional uh, beams are taking into account in this result? Yes, so uh, in two ways. Uh, one, uh, one of the graphs, uh, I fixed the antenna gain, so at 50 dB or 80 dB to compare that. In the other results, uh, uh, essentially implicitly, we as assigned an antenna gain to each choice of frequency, which was coherent with uh, that frequency. So if I can have uh, certain number of dBs uh, at uh, 20 gigahertz, I expect to have a bit more at 70 and a bit more at 150. So that was not explicit there. I don't even remember what those numbers are. Yeah. But yes, there is a, so as the bandwidth scales with frequency, also the available antenna gain does as well, which you know, compensates it. Otherwise, it would be yeah. 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 Like a yeah, okay. One more question here. Also, I see there is one online. There is connectivity. There are connectivity issues for underserved, uh, let's say, regions. So there is a problem that the satellite is serving you the signals from somewhere on Earth. Like for example, right? So like something that is getting from somewhere else. It could be, not necessarily, but. I like that. Like to to our right from somewhere. Like started this impact on the advent So we have not uh, done the end-to-end -end, uh, evaluation uh, that way. Uh, let me say two things. One is that the uh, server that provides the content may actually be fixed on the ground, may have a large antenna, so it's more traditional satellite communication. So that's not probably the critical link. Going to the satellite. The more critical link is the distribution of this content to the users on Earth, or even more critical, getting data from the users to the satellite. So that's one thing. Second thing is that uh, you know one of the scenarios that are considered is that the satellite itself has uh, some services uh, or some mobile edge uh, cloud or computing services, so it may actually execute applications there based on data. So I'm a user, I send to the satellite my data, the satellite does something and send back to me whatever I need. So there's no need for a server on the earth with a two hop link, not necessarily. But, but these are all scenarios that are being studied. So we, we don't really know what will happen. Okay. What Perfect. was the question? We're going to stop sharing so that people can see the other Okay. Is the informing going to play a role in the systems? Yes, of course. Uh, informing. <laughs> informing is going to play a role in these systems. And in fact, you know, one of the enabling technologies, when I spoke about antenna technology, I didn't just mean electromagnetics, but also I meant heavily signal processing and, and beamforming there. And also, there is a role for uh, beam estimation, beam tracking, and all that. Uh, Intermediate side would be simply after the forward, going forward. Uh, what we considered was amplifying forward, but I don't see why we couldn't do decoding forward, which would be better. And we haven't gone into the details of which relay model we're going to use. Uh, but again, the model is uh, there. We just uh, you just replace 
the equation we had with another, and you can, uh, you can find uh, the results there. And I don't know if there is uh, any specific reason why one would be preferred over the other, except you know, performance-wise, if there is any reason why you know, satellite people prefer one than, than, than the other. Feedback-based power rate control study for the systems. Uh, uh, I don't know. I'm not aware of uh, something. Well, you know, on, on this issue, for satellite systems, of course, there's a large literature, but for these new scenarios with, uh, uh, you know, non-terrestrial ar architectures for terrestrial end users, uh, uh, there is uh, little, in fact. Now, the feedback-based Power rate control has an obvious problem, which is uh, latency. And so it depends if you can track a channel effectively, given the latency you have. Or uh, I don't know how we can hear her. <laughs> is there any way we can uh, provide uh, audio? Open my audio, but I don't know if, uh, what echo we have to produce. Okay. <laughs> hmm? uh, okay. So, Melissa, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Melissa, can you hear me? Yeah, I can yeah. hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Hi. Hey, how are you? <laughs> Good, how are you? <laughs> so nice to see you. <laughs> Beautiful to see you, even live like this. <laughs> hey, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I can hold my questions for offline. Very, very interesting. Uh, All right. Okay, then. Okay, I thanks. see that, that, you, that you have too much delay to feedback the full channel response information but i think that there is enough time to feedback information on slower processes like for instance the gain the overall change in the gain that is caused by changes in the moisture and rain so that's the big box uh, feedback that might work there i think yeah and then you can also have prediction models, uh, which and can feed by data. And then, uh, you know, even though, though you don't have real time data, you can have predictions made based on uh, uh, slower data. And they still may work if there is a predictive <laughs> component in the evolution of the channel. So that's uh, yes. certainly true. OK, great. Thank you. Any other question? Yes. That's actually what we studied here. So our assumption was that the mobile terminal talks directly to the HAP. Yeah, I mean, the, on the downlink, that is... Uh, uh, I would say uh, quite feasible. On the uplink, you may have power issues, uh, but uh, yeah, that's up for evaluation. But you know, all possibilities are considered. Where, what we, you know, somewhat abstractedly assumed here is that uh, the link from whatever object uh, HAP or Leo to the ground is to the user. But you know, you can have the because that makes it more interesting, right? Because otherwise, if you have a uh, a fixed uh, ground station, which then distributes uh, to the users, so that's much closer to the traditional model, which is uh, better understood. Whereas here we're trying to break new ground and see if uh, other things can be done. Okay, thanks. Yes. I our refiner is like trying to do a global process where we are and offering the services. How do you, I know this is very normal, how do you envision 
powering those nodes are in the air. You mean for, for navigation, for, for buoyance? Yeah. And, and, uh, well, some nodes don't need buoyance. So, uh, so yeah. drones are the obvious example where you, know, you don't really care how much energy you consume to transmit because most of your energy will go into flying. Now, HAPS, if you use a blimp, that floats because of the balloon, right? So you don't need, once you're up, you don't need uh, to, to spend energy to keep it up. And also satellites, you know, they fly in orbit. And so they, once they launch, then they're placed, then uh, they don't need additional that. So the only uh, case where, you know, there's, and we actually have a paper where we studied this issue, uh, which shows not surprisingly that most of the energy goes into the, the motors and, and whatever yeah, is uh, with, with drones or objects that need to fly there. And that there, I mean, the, this is uh, the most limited scenario because I guess there are people here who know very well, you know, how, how much a drone can fly and, and how long you can do that. But this would be, you know, very interesting because of the agility. So, you know, on the stadium, if you can fly a, a swarm of drones on top and provide temporary connectivity, that would be, you know, a good solution. Once we solve the autonomy issue or the, the mission time, yeah, but uh, definitely if you, in, in the overall system budget, you have to take that into account, which we didn't. Thank you, any others? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's going to be low, but uh, I, I cannot give you a number now, but, uh, you know, this is a number we have, so I can ask Marco. I don't think, I haven't seen it. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, my observation was that, you know, we went you know, in the, in the years uh, to densify more and more. Now in the cities, we have nodes every 100 meters and with millimeter wave, that's becoming even more dense. Uh, uh, there's only so much you can do because uh, all real estate costs and also maybe uh, equipment investment. So uh, I guess... The, Yes, certainly. But uh, if you want to double the density of the base stations in New York, I don't know how that compares cost-wise with launching a satellite. <laughs> Given this cheap, uh, low cost, I mean, I wouldn't say cheap, but lower cost solutions that now become available where, you know, you can, or maybe sending a half. So, but, you know, this is, com I mean, these last questions, you know, show that this issue is complicated because uh, it's not just a communication theory problem. It's a, it's a system problem where you have uh, you know, economics, uh, you have uh, mechanical uh, and, and aerial uh, issues. Uh, and, and so you have, uh, if you want to make a, a complete or broad comparison, then you have to take into account many things, which is interesting, of course, but uh, we haven't done it. Okay. Well, thank oh, you very thank much you. again. Yeah.